Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, e uh, the webinar, Innovation, Productivity, and Challenges in the Digital Era, Asia, and Beyond. Today, we're very happy to feature uh, Professor Alan Kwan from, uh, from Hong Kong U Business School, uh, present his work together with, you know, with uh, three other co-authors on Red Tech. And our discussion is, Mal is um, uh, Ben Chang. Uh, so we'll just proceed, please. Uh, Alan, 25 minutes. Please take it over. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you for having us, uh, our paper here. And uh, thank you to uh, Ben in advance for what will be a wonderful discussion. Um, so this paper is uh, called RegTech. Um, and so uh, it's about the consequences of RegTech for financial institutions. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first question you might have is, what is RegTech? Um, so a lot of us are interested nowadays in FinTech. Um, and we're probably familiar with, you know, some of the front office applications of fintech, things like algorithms for quantitative trading, uh, digital assets, uh, robo advisory. Um, what we might be less familiar about is uh, regtech, which is sort of the an understudied aspect of fintech that applies mainly to the middle office or the back office. Um, and uh, uh, broadly speaking, regtech is about using technology. Uh, to improve the way that um, businesses manage regulatory compliance. You know, over the last decade, there's been a number of different regulatory initiatives, you know, Dodd-Frank, MIFID, Basel, and becoming a financial institution or operating as a financial institution is increasingly complicated uh, in terms of uh, regulation. So, um, more, and so RegTech is about managing that. And more broadly, RegTech is about helping managers keep track of data to gain visibility into what's happening inside the firm at any given point in time. Um, so you can think about things like risk management, uh, understanding what your positions are and calculating their risk in real time, uh, regulatory reporting, uh, uh, calculating uh, the value of your assets to see if you fit, fit uh, capital requirements. And then beyond the financials, it also includes things like quantifying the behavior of, of employees within the firm and their communications with outside parties. Um, so that's going to help with things like uh, consumer protection. So uh, RegTech is, is really wide ranging. And to give you a sense of how important RegTech is for the firm, uh, in 2019, uh, Refinitiv put out a report saying that, well, for public financial institutions, they spend about $2.2 .2 billion on auditing. And in that same year, they spent about $10 billion on RegTech. And reg tech investments, you know, what, whether you like uh, that last estimate or not, they're forecasted to grow as regulation um, continues to grow and financial institutions uh, are, are increasingly understand the value of technology and digital transformation. Uh, next slide, please. So reg tech is a really big deal, but we don't know much about it in the academic literature. So what we're gonna try to do in this paper is be one of the first papers uh, if not the first empirical paper to study uh, reg tech. And so the first question we're gonna ask is, what is the relationship between regulation and technology adoption? Does regulation actually cause technology adoption? So, um, and so it's not obvious uh, that this would necessarily be the response by financial institutions, because if for instance, you create a bunch of record keeping requirements and reporting requirements, you might just hire for instance, just more people. Um, and so we're gonna look at the size of that technological response and the factors that influence the type of technology which is adopted. Second, assuming that we've isolated a sort of, um, it, uh, sort of an experiment that allows us to study what happens when firms are incentivized to adopt technology, then we're gonna look at the results of adopting technology on firm operations and overall market structure. The idea is that while technology should allow uh, managers to see what's happening inside the firm, and that should affect their operations. And technology is something that's very costly, so that's going to affect which types of firms are able to compete um, using technology. And so this is uh, uh, something that we've been interested in a long time. Why it's uh, particularly difficult to study and why it might be interesting in our setting is that it's typically difficult to exogenize technology decisions. The standard refrain being that uh, if a company is doing well, um, it, they might invest more in technology, which makes it difficult to disentangle whether it's technology causing that performance. Uh, next slide, please. So how we're going to disentangle the two is by uh, looking at a, at a natural experiment. And so our setting is going to be the broker-dealer industry. 
And we're going to study an obscure rule, and not just the rule, but an even more obscure amendment to that rule. Uh, and so that rule is called 17A5. And so in 2014, uh, the SEC amended Rule 17A5. Um, and 17A5 refers to the record keeping requirements uh, for certain broker dealers. So the sort of impetus for this uh, uh, rule change was uh, was after Ponzi schemes um, that were very fam you know prominently discussed during the financial crisis and uh, some major bankruptcies of certain broker dealers such as you know MF Global. And the reason why uh, and, and sort of the common thread to all of these uh, to, uh, to these situations was essentially that the customers of these finan fund managers and financial institutions essentially had no visibility into what was happening inside uh, those uh, institutions. And so how, you know, how creditworthy was Bernie Madoff? Well, it, as creditworthy as he says, one, and, and, uh, and pretty much you get that information once a quarter. And so um, the idea was um, a lot of financial institutions, their creditworthiness was opaque. And we were going to, and the idea of amending Rule 17A5 was to make uh, things more transparent and to sort of systematize that transparency. So um, the amendment targeted broker dealers that were carrying. So the idea is these broker dealers, if you give them their money, they help you execute and you know uh, a certain book. They're going to also hold on to your money instead of non-carrying broker dealers who outsource the the custody of the assets to a custodian. Um, and so the idea is the carrying broker could you know uh, that that's where the big problems could be. And so the idea is if you're a caring broker, management must attest to having internal controls over compliance with certain financial responsibility rules. So in particular, uh, two things. One is customer asset segregation. So imagine that you gave your money to a broker um, and they now have a billion dollars of assets. Well, they, one way you could think about it is that broker can manage a billion dollar of assets and then, you know, once a quarter figure out who, who, which customers are owed what. The other way you could do it is you could, from the outset, if you have 500 customers, keep 500 different accounts. So you have to segregate customer assets instead of commingling them. You know, the, obviously this is particular to, for instance, Ponzi scheme. Um, and then required capital requirements. So financial institutions often have required capital requirements. Instead of attesting to it once a quarter, you have to demonstrate your ability to calculate, perform this required capital calculation moment to moment. And so not just at the end of the reporting period, uh, but really just literally anytime someone asks. Um, and then finally, you can't just say you comply. Um, an auditor must attest to the operating effectiveness of the control. So uh, why is this going to compel reg tech potentially? It's because if you think about it, these are very data intense regulations. So a customer, for example, um, if you have 500 customers, instead of keep keeping track of one pot of money with, let's say, 3,000 potential securities, you have to keep track of 500 times 3,000 now, that is all of a sudden a lot more data that you have to keep track of. Second, if you have to then calculate required capital, that means on a daily basis, you have to integrate market prices, mark to market all your positions, um, so on and so forth. So this is actually very difficult um, to solve without some sort of either large increase in labor or some large increase in automation. Uh, Al Alan. Uh, just a mm -hmm. quick clarification. So essentially, the change is that um, the broker has to review play by play to every customer anytime. Specifically, they have to issue regular reports to customers. But it, basically, the um, the regulator uh, the regulator still will will ask for a lot of these uh, numbers at the end of the quarter. But if the regulator asks, you have to be able to produce it at a moment's notice. You can't just say we have typhoon in Hong Kong. So maybe the internet connection is not stable. I see. I see. Uh, as Ellen is trying to get back, a quick question is, it doesn't mean that, I mean, in the past, the regulators could ask the question anytime the same, right? Um, so they, they could ask, but the thing is, if, like, for example, uh, you asked me these numbers pre-2014, and I just didn't have an answer, then uh, that would probably be okay. You could just say, well, um, you could just say, well, you know, uh, give me a week or give me till the end of the quarter. That's when I have to report to you anyway. Like, like in other words, you're given clemency uh, for for just not having the number on the spot because the expectation is not it is not that you would know your credit, you know, your your capital requirement, your your um, 
the amount of regulatory capital you have at any given point in time. I mean, that, it's a it's a pretty complicated calculation. I so essentially, what you're saying is that there has to be more instantaneous revelation upon request. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I used to work um, uh, over the counter trading. It's one of those things where um, it's it's really complicated to do. So people just do it periodically, typically, and. Um, um, and so now you have to do it, you know, instantaneously. It's just much more complicated. Um, so this came into effect uh, for carrying broker dealers. Uh, Non-carrying broker dealers are ones which just outsource to custodians. So it's the custodians reporting problem. Um, and if we're going to make the argument that, you know, this is a good counterfactual, but the idea is that, you know, I actually don't know myself as a customer of, you know, various discount brokers who's carrying and who's not. They're very similar. Most customers don't know the difference. Um, and, and so the idea is that this forms a good control group. Um, next slide, please. So um, before I discuss each finding, just high, high level, first is we're going to study how regulation affects technology adoption. So we're going to split it up into direct versus indirect. Direct meaning uh, things that are necessary to comply. So obviously, we'll get the standard, Aberdeen, uh, the, the standard technology numbers from the Aberdeen uh, database, higher IT budgets, more servers and computers. But uh, we're also going to be able to study specifically types of software necessary to comply. So uh, a lot of this is about record keeping and producing reports. So obviously data management software. We're also going to get what's called ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning. ERP is basically about centralizing different data sources into uh, like basically a central repository so that you can produce analytics. That's what ERP software typically refers to. Um, and so we're going to focus on things that are necessary to comply. And then indirect meaning, well, now that you've built this data infrastructure, they're very data intensive. And so the marginal benefit, uh, the marginal cost of uh, building a uh, new technology, um, because you have the data infrastructure, is relatively uh, lower. So one way you could think about it is all of us might build a computer to run machine learning models and linear regressions. Once you have a nice graphics card, maybe you could go mine Bitcoin. Not that I would ever do that with you know university money, but just the idea is that you, you sort of understand the logic of what, what indirect means here. Um, and then secondly, how to, uh, if, if you believe us that we've really isolated a, uh, an exogenous sort of incentive to adopt technology, how does that technology adoption affect firm operations? So we're going to find customer complaints drop. Um, and so this is the key performance indicator for financial advisor firms. And then secondly, we're going to have something to say about labor market concentration, because the natural implication of costly technology investment is that only certain firms are going to be able to make these investments. Next slide, please. Um, and so we think this is interesting because uh, it plays into a literature about, um, into three literatures. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just be brief here. One is why do uh, organizations adopt technology? Second, what are the drivers of financial misconduct? And third, um, internal audit requirements. So the general statement we're going to make is um, regulation has a role in, in compelling technology adoption, and digital transformation, and technology has a role, or sorry, regulation has a role in compelling technology adoption. And then second, the um, technology that, that gets adopted could also be one way that managers can help govern the firm and reduce financial misconduct. Next slide, please. Um, and so you might ask, well, you know, again, it's not obvious that more record keeping leads to more technology. Um, but the main reason why we went down this route when starting this project is because everything we read talked about technology. So for instance, Deloitte has a nice white paper where they basically said that, you know, many broker dealers in response to the amendment had, um, that they audited had in-house technology that was built many years ago and that uh, BDs found it difficult to provide report logic details um, that auditors needed for testing. In other words, their old systems just didn't work. And then after the amendment, Ernst Young reports that uh, they invested in, that BDs invested in shoring of technology and then centralizing data into a single source. And so that's the idea of an ERP system where you centralize different data sources. And you can think of it as simply as, I have a lot of different customers, lots of different positions, I need to synchronize a lot of different data, right, in order to, mark, to market everything. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so the way we're going to study this is in a differences in differences design. Um, this is a one-time uh, single shot. It's not staggered uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, but the idea is that we're going to have a firm year panel. The Y variable is going to be some sort of software investment, customer complaints, 
um, some sort of outcome of the firm. And then we're gonna have firm and time fixed effects, uh, firm and geography by time fixed effects actually. And then an interaction term for post times treated where post starts in 2013. Um, and then we're going to have various controls for things like size, headcount, employee traits. We're going to have linear trends for investment advisors. Um, the idea being that some broker dealers are also investment advisors, and they might also be affected by Dodd Frank. Um, and so that's uh, that refers to another paper that uh, me and Ben uh, uh, wrote a couple of uh, years ago. Um, and so just standard difference in difference design. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so well, the first thing to do, of course, is to plot some of these. And so we're going to define reg tech investments broadly as either an investment in ERP systems or data management software. And what you see if you plot this is something that just matches the timing of the regulation. So the initial sort of announcement was 2013, and then the, fall, the sort of final uh, compliance date was 2014. And you just basically see this jump in, in reg tech investment for the treated group over this time period that wasn't there previously. And so if you read the y-axis, it's basically to the tune of about 20 something percent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so if you break it down by specific types of software, so the 20% is the last column, 24% specifically. The first two columns is breaking out the two types of, um, of reg tech. One is ERP, that, that sort of central nervous system software, and then the data management, which is about managing specific pieces of data. And so it's more about that ERP system. And ERP system is actually a very expensive investment for an organization. And so there's a 31% increase in investment there and uh, a 17.7% increase in data management. And so what, what does 30.31% mean? It means um, basically uh, the number of programs that you've bought that are classified as ERP programs increase. So it's about one or two programs basically per financial institution, but each ERP software system is a pretty big investment itself. What does it mean in dollar terms? Next slide, please. Um, what, what does it mean in dollar terms? Sorry, let me jump. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, it means basically something similar in terms of dollar investment. So these numbers are from Aberdeen. Um, we have them for a larger sample um, than we do the specific lines of software. Um, but what we have is basically an increase in um, IT budget of about 40%. So it's even larger than 30% that we saw before. Uh, again, an ERP system is pretty expensive. Um, and this corresponds to servers. You need to dump the data onto servers. Um, we see, uh, and so that's column one. Column two says, well, you know, there's also an increase in PCs in general, um, but that increase is smaller because it makes sense that this is really an increase in infrastructure. And so as a result, things like servers and overall IT budget increase, whereas PCs increase by a smaller amount. And then you might ask, okay, why, you know, how costly is this? Well, it's about four and a half percent of assets. Um, and so that's column four. And so why is it that, you know, organizations maybe were under invested in technology? It's because it's actually quite expensive. Um, that, that, that's basically what these estimates reveal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, indirectly, uh, now that you've built this ERP system, it's going to be relatively easy for you to build out follow-on analytics. So what we show you here is what's called the CRM software, where now that you have you know, data on all of your customers segregated, what you can do is then track their assets under management. That's by definition, the law forces you to do that. And you can track things like your, um, you know, uh, specific things about the customer, because now that you have an account for every customer, now you can put in what's called customer relationship and that might make your financial advisors more effective. Next slide, please. So when we look at complementary technologies, things like CRM in the middle, um, we see a big increase. We also see other types of uh, complementary technologies, such as website technologies. Website technologies that are premium are things like things that allow customers to see dashboards or uh, that collect data on customers and the way they interact and sort of, you can think about when you go to a, a broker dealer website, those interactions then get deposited into a CRM. And then finally, document and communication management software. You can think of these things like Microsoft Teams and Slack, which are really used to codify the interactions that you have um, with external parties. So instead of you know calling people or doing things over text, you can now do it over a formal channel that then gets centralized into a repository, which allows you to then do analytics on that. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at uh, things that are not data intensive, like antivirus software or just other technologies in general, you actually see no effects. This is sort of a placebo. So you take a look at all the technologies other than the ones that we've counted in antivirus software, we basically see no effect, which I think makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so you might ask, okay, well, this is great to see technology adoption, but is there any reason to believe that the firms would operate differently? Um, and so surveys basically suggest the average financial institution would say that technology and reg tech is not just used by compliance. It's only a, a fifth of them that say that. Next slide, please. Um, so what, the way technology could help with, for instance, reducing financial misconduct is that now that you've codified all the different customer accounts, if someone has bad performance or now that you've codified communications, if um, you know you have these interactions, what you could do is run analytics on them. So there are examples of, uh, FINRA talks about this a lot, where you email uh, Microsoft Teams, Conduct. Next slide, please. Um, next, slide. Uh, yeah. So if you if you look at um, the rule adoption in event time, what you see is a, um, a, a jump in technology in 2013, and in 2014, about a year after the implementation of some of these systems, you see a drop in complaints. And so uh, this drop in complaints is um, you know it's pretty sharp um, in 2014. And persistent, and what you see is basically a drop of about four to four and a half percent. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is the probability that the financial institution receives complaints, specifically that refers to column one. So about a four point three percent drop, or four point four percent drop. Um, you can do it in terms of the count of complaints. That's column two, um, and then you can do stricter definitions of misconduct, such as the Egan Mafos Rue version. Um, and so in general, uh, if you look at the coefficients. What this refers to is about a 40% uh, is 40 of the unconditional mean. So for instance, column one, the coefficient of 4.3 gets compared to the mean of the dependent variable of 10%, right? So it's about a 40% drop, um, or if you prefer column two, then it's about a 12% drop. And so it's pretty significant. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm, I have like a minute or two left. So I, I guess I'll just talk about things at a high level. We do an IV analysis to see if the change in technology can explain the variation in a drop in complaints. We also, uh, and so it turns out to be yes. So one could make the argument that tech adoption. Ellen, you have about the, three um, currently in the left. tech adoption. Oh, okay, okay, that, that's great to know. Okay, so I'll slow down just a little. The variation in tech adoption induced by the natural by the uh, amendment uh, of 1785 in the first stage uh, is strong enough to explain the drop in complaints. Um, and so that's basically what that analysis shows. Um, we also have cross-sectional analysis about uh, what types of firms benefit them the most. So one thing we find is that we find weaker effects when the company already had a chief compliance officer, which is a proxy for the strength of internal controls. So if you were just a strong company in terms of an internal controls before that, then naturally inducing internal controls should, should lead to a smaller effects. And we also find stronger effects for firms which uh, serve retail customers. So if you think about you know, um, where, where technology might help the most, it's sort of on the extensive margin. We talk about things like technology and financial inclusion, not for you know, sophisticated customers that are large that can monitor their broker, but you know, maybe retail customers who are less sophisticated. That's typically the relationship. So naturally we find that this inducement of technology is, it has a stronger effect of, of on misconduct and for uh, firms which serve retail customers. And uh, finally, we do a bunch of different robustness checks, both on the technology adoption side and the customer complaints side. We do course and exact matching to, to rule out covariate different or to mitigate concerns about covariate differences. We drop banks, which face a lot of different um, regulations over this period. And uh, we do various types of trend, uh, trend analysis uh, for size or, or brokers that offer specific products. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so you might be asking yourself, does this, uh, you know, this sounds great, but was it worth it uh, from a financial perspective? Um, and the answer turns out basically just to be, um, you know, the, while, while reducing misconduct is important socially, in terms of just the pure dollar impact, um, the, the implied savings from the complaint decline was about $60,000 for the average carrying broker dealer. Whereas, I don't know if I believe $10 million, but you might think, that installing ERP software, databases, the personnel, um, all the external services and support contracts um, could be over a million dollars. And so you think about saving uh, you know, $60,000 a year, even $100,000 a year, it takes you about 10 years to pay back this cost. It's pretty clear why 
uh, you know, firms may not maybe didn't want to adopt this technology in the first place. Now, of course, there could be, um, you know, other things like reputation. Um, you know, it's very difficult to really quantify the full cost of tech of, of cost benefit analysis of tech adoption. But just on, based on the margins we can observe directly, it's it's not it, it's it's pretty obvious why from a financial perspective, institutions that technology would pay for itself immediately. Um, and so maybe why technology was underinvested to begin with. Next slide, please. Um, I don't have that much time, but the last thing I just want to talk about is um, we do some analysis to show that there seems to be a consolidation of people into the firms that are larger and have technology uh, that were affected by the amendment. And so- Helen, I do hope that you can wrap it up in a minute, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so the idea of this is that uh, technology has a large fixed cost and fixed costs are e easier for larger competitors. So the last analysis we do in the paper, uh, which I don't have time to talk about today, is just that um, technology seems to be, uh, the firms that invested in technology as a result of this amendment seem to be drawing in uh, financial advisors from other, um, from other firms. Um, and th this speaks to this idea of increasing concentration as a result of the technology. Um, next slide, please. Um, to wrap up, uh, hopefully uh, you believe that regulation does compel technology adoption and that technology adoption at financial institutions does have effects on the firm um, as well as the overall market. Um, and hopefully uh, there, uh, um, uh, you become interested in, in learning more about RegTech as a result. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, ben, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we thank you for helping us to discuss the paper. 20 minutes, a little bit more, yeah, just in case. Please, your turn. Okay, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Okay, this is great. So uh, this is great. Uh, so thank you very much to Bernard for inviting me to discuss this paper. When I saw this paper, I was in immediately intrigued because I do research on technology adoption and I actually de developed the research, recent research interests on um, measuring regulations. So, wow, what a, what a great timing to read this paper. Now I have to say, I highly recommend this paper. I enjoy the reading it. So let's dive into this. Uh, hopefully I can first, let me first give you an um, overview of the paper. So. There's this buzzword called the rec tag. And for a while, I have been trying to figure out what's the difference between rec tag or technology adoption, FinTech, you know, and there are all these buzzwords going through. So in this paper, the definition of rec tag is very clear. It's basically a firm's investment in technology for the purpose of regulatory compliance. So you're not investing for customers or payment, this is for regulatory compliance. So that's the definition of rec tech here, which I think is very appropriate. Now the research question, which I believe it's a very fresh one, is trying to understand firms reg, rec tech investments and their effects on firms operations and also speak some um, to the market structure of the uh, financial industry. Now to give you a bit of a, um, a background and also to comprehend the challenge in understanding and tackling this question. I've been working on technology adoption for a long time. And one thing that comes to this whole field is that the firm's adoption technology is always uh, or oftentimes endogenous and they're driven by factors highly related to the firms. So for example, uh, in my job market paper, um, uh, if I, uh, I study how firms adopt automation to re replace their production workers or secretaries, which we call routine task labor. And this is a very, very calculated decision uh, that firms try to implement. They're not going to replace their workers at any time. Uh, and actually, they're more likely to replace in bad times. The reason is that the opportunity cost for you to stop your factory and replace and restructure is much cheaper in bad times. So given that technology is highly endogenous in most cases, how can we have uh, speak a little bit to the causation of rec tech investment on firm's outcome, right? That is a 
fairly challenging task. And I am very glad to read this paper and see how the authors tackle this very challenging question. Okay, so what does this paper do? The paper first exercised a very nice design to study a shock. So the shock is this uh, regulatory uh, mandate in 2013 and 14 that makes it more stringent for certain broker dealers to disclose and to enhance their internal control attestment, uh, attestations. So what we're gonna to learn today is broker dealers, which I believe is a really important financial uh, institution. And the shock applies mainly to someone called carrying broker dealers. So this is something you have to think about, like a broker dealer is who's gonna take the assets and hold it rather than someone which is called non-carrying broker dealers, which basically they're gonna accept the order and then they're gonna ship it out to another broker dealers to, um, to help the trade. So now we have the treated and control groups very clearly specified by this regulation. What are the findings? Well, first um, they look at the first pass, which is does this regulatory shock make the carry uh, or carrying broker dealers invest in regulation related technologies, such as the ERP Alan mentioned in uh, the presentation. And they do find there is a very big in, uh, a direct effect on uh, the treated broker dealers technology investment. Now the key mechanism, which makes me feel very excited about is that the regulation related investment not only stop there, but also complement um, broker dealers investment in non-regulation related expenditures. That's where they studied the other kind of a capital investments, specifically about techno other technologies, which are not directly related to co regulatory compliance, but can be used for production. And what outcome do we see here is that the treated broker dealers exhibit reduced customer compli complaints and also reduced employee misconduct. Wow, so you put together, what you see here is that if you, we ask broker dealers to comply and to invest in the technology for compliance, actually there is a, a positive effect for firm's production, right? So the takeaway is that reg tech investment can have this positive effect on non-compliance functions to firms through technology adoption. Okay, so I have three comments coming up um, about this paper. And the, my, my goal here obviously is trying to enhance and try to give some uh, uh, sort of suggestions and hopefully to be beneficial to Alan and the co-authors in this wonderful paper. So my first uh, curiosity actually is, what do we mean by the effects of reg tech, right? Are we studying the effects of regulation treatment or are we studying the effects of regulatory investments? And to me, they actually bear slightly different interpretations. You see, the effects of reg tech would say, if I spend on technology, but not on something else for compliance, how would that you know, generate firm outcome effects? But if I study the effects on regulation, that means I'm exposed to a regulatory shock doesn't matter I invest in tech or not, right? How would my firm outcome look like? And these are two slightly different questions. And in this paper, majority of the analysis actually focuses on the firm's response to regulation shocks. In other words, the, the paper asks the question of how do broker dealers get treated by regulation differ from broker dealers not treated by regulation? Now, as you can see, they are very correlated and likely, and I believe actually in the paper, even if you do reg tech investment, the results will be the same. And actually the authors do have something to say about it through the instrument variable analysis, which I'll show you in the next slide. But I think it will be important to uh, clarify the definition of what do we mean by reg tech investments effect. So the comments here really speaks to what if when two firms 
get treated by the regulatory shock and they behave differently or respond differently. Say maybe some broker dealers responded by investing rec tank and others just resort to the old compliance methods, right? And if our goal is to understand rec tech's effect, then do we observe the broker dealers, the treated broker dealers invest the, who invested in rec tech generate different outcomes from the broker dealers who resort to other or old compliance methods. And that I think is a, is a, is a um, more direct uh, a response to analyzing the effects of rec tech investment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the authors did actually construct the IV approach. And here, the, 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 uh, the in, in interpretation is very clear about rec tech investment. So how do we do this? So the idea is that imagine you see broker dealer investing in rec tech. Now, we learned that you know, in the literature, you know, technology investment is endogenous. Now, they're going to use the um, broker dealer's exposure to the regulatory shock as the exogenous IV to instrument the broker dealer's investment in rec tech. Great. I think that's a fantastic uh, approach. And I actually wish most of the analysis about the outcomes um, would be conducted through this method. It seems to be clear, clearer to me that this is what you want to say about the effects of rec tech investment. Now, as we know, instrument variables are hard, and a lot of times you have to overcome two obvious hurdles. One is the relevance condition, the other is exclusion restrictions. Relevance condition, you can test it, and the authors have already showed that. And the challenge really is exclusion restriction, which is not testable. So we're going to have to be based on intuition. So the comments here is that do we feel 100% uh, confident that the instrument has the exclusion restriction condition? So what it means is that do we believe or um, uh, 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 are we very confident that the regulatory treatment, which is IV, reduces the customer complaints or employee misconduct only through rec tech investment or through some other channels? In other words, you and I, we are both exposed um, to the uh, IV, to the uh, regulatory treatment. That's our instruments, right? And we both invested in rec tech. Is it possible that our outcome is not only going through our investment, but maybe going through some other treatment due to this regulatory shock? For example, the regulatory shock may request you not only to invest in REC uh, tech technology, but also to maybe more directly have more mandates to tra treat your customers, to interact with your customers through channels outside the investment. That is obviously um, a, a very high hurdle. That, and that's the really the challenge the way I see about exclusion restriction. And then to bring one more example, the time period we study here is 2003, 13, and 14. And we know Dodd-Frank was passed in 2010, uh, 2010, 2010, but a lot of provisions become effective in 2014. So can there be also be some other uh, treatment from other regulations um, that differentially treat the broker dealers who are carrying and not carrying? And how can we try to be very confident and have a tight identi identification that uh, what we observe here is indeed a shock only uh, go through the rec tech investment. And I think that's something um, the authors probably would want to think a little bit more and try to defend this wonderful exercise a little bit uh, um, more in depth. Okay, so more broadly, and uh, my my personal view on regulation is that think about you are you have a firm when you comply with all sorts of regulation, it's a very ultra complicated matter, right? It's not a simple one. Why? For example, first. Firms may be subject to multiple regulations 
from multiple agencies. And this is one of the paper I have been collaborating right now with Francesco Tribi from UC Berkeley. And we're trying to show that it is when you come when it comes to understanding the firm's total regulatory pressure, it really comes from multiple sources. So when we look at a shock to a firm, how can we think of at the same time, other regulatory shocks may also be differentially affecting the treated and control groups. So this is this is not to give a, a criticism or or uh, 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 even a comment to the authors, this is a more um, try to say that how can we going forward think about regulation and using the single regulatory shocks. Moreover, firms may also face very differential regulatory enforcement, meaning you and I were both uh, treated by the shock, but maybe the regulators, regulators may enforce differently to us. And, and third, firms may respond to regulatory compliance differently. For example, as I mentioned earlier, some firm will resort to technology, others may not. It depends on how expensive um, the technology adoption really is for the firm. Other firms may choose not completely ignore the compliance task. They're gonna just take the risk, right? This goes back to Gary Becker's point that you know, regulatory compliance is only effective when the cost of uh, being caught is really high, right? So put together, I want to bring to you the audience a picture that complying with regulation is such a massive, complicated matter. And uh, through that, we have to appreciate papers like this paper, uh, studies like this paper, to going through this and try to get a tighter and tighter identification to get the results. My one last point is try to say that when it comes to regulation, clearly Alan mentioned that you know reg tech, which is investment, capital investment for regulation, is a fast rising portion. But the elephant in the room, even I believe up until this past decade, is still uh, uh, um, in somewhere else rather than capital spending, right? If you go to a company, you ask a company, how much are you spending on regulatory enforcements? They're gonna give you a number. And you ask them, what are the proportions of your spending for regulatory compliance? And here are two surveys I want to quickly bring to you that in the manufacturing uh, 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 survey, the overall industry spent $138 billion on regulatory compliance. This is only the direct regulatory compliance cost. And as you can see here, 94% or 95% is come from full-time equivalent employment spending, right? So the elephant in the room really is about those, those secretaries, those compliance workers, those um, people, those employees you spend on. And for finance, the number just goes even bigger. The staff-related expense accounts for over 90% of all regulatory compliance spending. So the elephant in, in the room is labor. And this is not trying to diminish that capital investments is not important. Just the opposite, this is trying to say that if we want to understand the full picture of the regulatory in, uh, ex, uh, expenses or compliance expenses, we need to understand both the reg tech and the labor spending. So motivated by this service, I got really excited about, you know, how can we get a more fuller picture of uh, firms or establishments regulatory spending? So here I want to very briefly talk about um, a paper I have with Francesco, as I mentioned earlier, about measuring firms regulatory compliance. In this case, we're going to only go through labor, which I believe is a good complementary to Alan's paper. So we're going to try to first measure each firm's percentage labor spending on regulation related tasks. So these are basically think about a firm may hire a hundred employees in all sorts of occupations and each occupation performs all sorts of tasks. And we can, we can categorize those tasks, right? A professor is doing a lot of research and teaching tasks, but a regulatory compliance officer um, 
will perform a lot of regulation related tasks. And we're going to leverage on this massive microdata from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics of 1.2 million establishments, which will also show you the occupation composition within each establishment. Therefore, for example, if you see an Apple store down the road in, Lo in the Los Angeles, you can see how many of the employees in that Apple store is um, sales representatives, how many of them are in charge of the, um, the compliance, how many of them are in charge of the management, so on and so forth. And putting together, I want to make a point that you know this measure it can be massively useful and as a as a, 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 a complementary to what we have to think about capital. For one thing, for example, if you are curious about okay, in the United me. States, uh, two minutes. Great, Rebel, thank you. Two minutes, please. I only have one more slide. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're curious about in the United States, which firm, big or small, are affected by the regulatory burden, right? And what we can show here using this microdata is a striking figure that it's not the smallest one that we thought of. So if, so if we're curious of whether regulation is really hammering the tiny, tiny, the smallest, maybe even the startups, that does not seem likely to be the case. And if you believe it's really the giants, right? The, the biggest firm are hammered by regulatory compliance. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case either. The, 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 the firms that are percentage wise, mostly affected by the regulation are actually the middle sized firms. Firms around like 400, 500 employees. And this is a profound finding because if you think about if you have a you have a small firm, right? Five employee firm, you want to grow to 500. You have this giant hurdle to overcome, uh, you know, to 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 pay the regulatory cost until you become 5,000 employee firm. Then yeah, percentage wise, your regulatory burden will go down eventually. So through here, I'm trying to uh, make a point that. There are so many fronts of regulation uh, uh, um, pressures of is a firm or establishment have to endure. And how can we give a more comprehensive characterization and understanding of firms' regulatory environment seems to be an intriguing area. So put together, I see this paper as a fascinating first step at RegTech and its effect on firms. And I think there is definitely going to be follow-up research on you know, um, studying all sorts of ripple effects of uh, what happens after the um, uh, 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 regulation is more stringent, is investment, hiring, whatever. And I think that this paper also offers a, a broad spectrum of interesting findings. And I do believe that, and I encourage more and more people to join us and try to understand the overall regulatory environment that firms faces nowadays, either in the United States or in Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's now, um, Alan, before I, I give you the opportunity to uh, to respond, uh, maybe it's appropriate to just take some comments uh, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the floor. Michael. Uh, yeah. So the, the, this, is, uh, this is very interesting paper. So, um, I don't know much about the uh, the regulation uh, regulatory policy. You know, Alan is studying his paper, but I'm trying to make an analogy to uh, one uh, uh, policy shift that I, I know uh, better in China. Uh, that is, uh, you know, loan to deposit ratio regulation. It used to be the case that the, the central bank is was monitoring like end of month or end of the quarter loan to deposit ratio in China. And then they realized, you know, a lot of uh, uh, medium size and small banks actually, um, you know, do window dressing at the end of the uh, inspection period. And then they start to do it on a daily basis. But, you know, if I think about that uh, uh, policy uh, shift, then, then I started to think about a lot of interesting things uh, that you, you didn't uh, uh, mention in the presentation. One is, uh, I think, you know, the discussion Ben uh, uh, mentioned, there are just a lot of uh, 
heterogeneity in, in terms of uh, you know uh, how effective the, the the regulation hits uh, those uh, those uh, those firms right um in the case of uh, uh, china in, in that case i just mentioned uh, small banks and medium sized banks uh, they they did a lot of uh, window dressing and big banks didn't do much uh, window dressing so you know uh, then i think it will be kind of uh, uh, interesting to know in the first place how much of uh, heterogeneity in exposure to uh, this regulation shift uh, in this uh, in this particular case right and the the, the second is uh, uh, is there alternative ways to uh, comply to uh, this uh, policy shift for instance uh, in, in china's case i can i can see two ways one is uh, small banks medium sized banks uh, they they make more investments uh, they they try to come up with uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, capital uh, so that they can they can do this daily uh, 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 data collection Alternatively, actually, what we uh, observed uh, in China is that those are small and medium banks and started to, you know, shift uh, assets uh, uh, from uh, uh, balance sheet to off balance sheet more permanently. So instead of uh, uh, making this kind of investment, they, they just completely uh, change their business uh, structure. Uh, so I'm not so sure if. Uh, the regulation uh, policy, regulatory policy, you study in this case is uh, dramatic so, uh, enough to shift you know business structure uh, in a permanent way. But I'm just curious to know there, there's just multiple. So the first of all, there's there seems to be a heterogeneity in exposure to uh, regulation, and second, there are multiple ways to you know uh, deal with uh, uh, the regulation. So I just want to know uh, in more details, you know, what happened in in this particular case. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Pusha? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, I have a email some question to, to Alan, but I would like to echo the comments from, uh, from Ben about the uh, labor uh, number of employees, because if you invest more in reg tech, then of course you may, you may replace some labors in compliance, but of course, by investing more in reg tech, maybe you will need to hire even more people doing compliance work. So I think they may probably look at that, but I, I don't know how refined the data would, would be available in, in, in doing this. Thank you. Uh, my, I, I guess my turn before I, I give the, Alan the, um, uh, the chance to respond. I, I think what it, what's intriguing is really that there is a change in regulation, at least in the atmosphere and in the in in, in the application of the regulation. And like Michael said, um, what is interesting is really about the heterogeneity on how this impact on firms. And uh, so what I'm curious, and I hope you can clarify, is that among the treated group, meaning that those that are affected, um, is there uh, what 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 is the variation among uh, between them? Um, I th is this an opportunity to to identify, or maybe you have already done so, the impact of adopting the machinery uh, in changing um, the behavior? You you show us the average, I think, but I want to see if I can compare those that adopt and those that do not adopt even though they are, uh, while they are both conditioned on, they are both uh, have, are treated. Just, uh, just a request for clarification. Okay, uh, Ellen, uh, your turn to answer, please, before we go to a second round or so on. Your turn, please. Oh yeah, um, yeah so these were wonderful uh, comments, both from the floor as well as uh, Ben. And uh, I, I take the point um, very kindly that uh, you know, on average, most regulatory compliance, like the bulk of that cost is not technology, it's actually labor. Um, I, I, we agree with that. Um, you know, in the case of our setting, uh, I guess we do look at uh, job postings. The problem with um, studying that more intensively is that a lot of financial institutions, especially small ones, just don't end up on national job boards, which is typically how we get this sort of data. So for us to study labor a little bit more comprehensively, unfortunately, we, we have some analysis in the paper, but it's only for some of the larger firms. And so we would love to do more on 
on labor. Um, but uh, I, I guess without the nice data at the BLS, it's kind of hard for us to do that. But you know, a point well taken. Um, and but you know, that that's something we'll consider as we try to expand our our uh, set of data sources. Um, and you know, I sort of I completely agree with the the comments. Um, you know, uh, I think the one thing is, um, you know, in terms of the IV, I guess the, I guess the answer is, I guess, uh, we, we kind of hope that this is the only regulation that the outcome variables that we study. Um, we, we tried searching um, for other regulations that would affect carrying broker dealers in particular uh, around this time, and we couldn't really find any. Uh, of course, um, uh, you know, we haven't, um, you know, we're the authors, and so, of course, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But we've tried, and we, you know, at the end of the day, with the exclusion restrictions, untestable. But hopefully, you know, um, as far as we can tell, this is the only thing that really affects um, broker dealers in particular, carrying broker dealers in particular. Um, and uh, you know, uh, your comments are well taken about you know just the nature of what it means to comply. Um, but hopefully, in our setting, it's pretty clear that you know this is a very data intensive regulation and so the only real thing that that's really happening is just the frequency with which you have to produce reports and so um it's not that you have to do anything particular with respect to um what you how you address your employees or anything like that or how frozen again i i think the Maybe yeah. the typhoon effect. Okay, uh, we, yeah, we lost the in the past effect. two minutes. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so, um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree with the discussion points, and uh, I'd love to, you know, sort of get your slides and learn more offline. Um, in terms of uh, Michael's question about heterogeneity, um, so uh, and as well as uh, different ways of complying, one thing we're we're looking at is can we so right now we, we know basically we don't we only study whether or not you were treated at the beginning of the sample we're trying to collect data to see whether or not down the road we can study whether you stop becoming a caring broker dealer and you convert to another type it, it's pretty rare in the data though so uh, but i think it does happen and we can try to study that so one way you can basically comply with the regulation stop being a caring broker dealer um but the problem is that that's pretty rare um and then you know there might be other reasons why you stop caring you know because um, you know, there might be other business conditions. So, um, but that's something we're looking at. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the question about heterogeneity across firms, which I guess Bernie, uh, as well as uh, Michael raised, uh, basically, um, you know, these uh, broker dealers are relatively large uh, in general that are carrying, um, because I guess to begin with, I guess the set of carrying uh, infrastructure, you are, you tend to be larger um, but I, I take uh, the comment really kindly that we should look at those who comply relatively less with technology, but instead comply in other ways with like more labor on uh, things of that nature. Um, one limitation again is just that uh, because a lot of these broker dealers are small, they don't show up in like national job boards. It's kind of hard to study their labor response, but we could try to, for instance, collect LinkedIn data or something like that, um, which would be, um, you know, obviously difficult, but doable. Um, we could see if we could try to study like, the shift in composition of workers via, you know, LinkedIn. Um, so that's one way we can maybe respond to it. Um, you know, I, I take I take this. It seems like there's a common theme, right? Like it may not just be technology, but there's this labor element in the room, and that's something we'll consider as we revise the paper. Um, actually, along this line about the hetero the, the heterogeneities in the regulations, I will have a comment on on what Ben has said about. Um, hiring labor for compliances in dealing with the regulation. My understanding is that even for the same regulatory requirement, the application very often varies. Um, the difference between the large and the small is clearly possibly an economies of scale effect, but the difference between the small and the medium I think may relate to about how closely, uh, how how much they have to to deal with the regulation. I wonder if that is an angle that uh, Ben and his work uh, has already adopted. Um, and then I also want to comment back on on Alan's work is about like the purpose here is about adoption of the technology affecting your ability uh, or affecting your performance in comply, uh, in complying with the regulations. So I wonder like if we, if we all if we, if we all have to carry, so it means that we all should adopt 
right? So why some yes and why some don't? And really, can you compare among them? Can you identify the productivity of technology, uh, of digitization um, in, in, I would call it the, the linkage between digitization and the productivity and compliances? I, I think that would be an interesting angle. My understanding is that a lot of work has not yet produced clear evidence on the productivity increase in digitization. Yeah, yeah I think that's completely right. Um, uh, we should uh, try to take a stab at it. I mean, I guess one, one issue is limitation of the types of performance information you have in the broker deal industry. Um, but we should definitely take a look at which types of banks, or sorry, financial, not banks, broker dealers just don't adopt technology and uh, which ones find it less profitable to do so, for sure. I mean, it'd be a, it's a big question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have any further comments? And, okay, set. All right, I, I want to thank I want to want to thank Alan and also Ben for giving us a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and discussion uh, on a very stimulating topic. Um, I would like to invite people to come again. Um, uh, the the next one is uh, by Alberto Rossi, George Tang, and his work is going to be on uh, his work is crowdsourcing financial information to change spending behavior, and the discussion is um, is 10 U1 of NUS. So I look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate, much appreciate your participation and contribution. Thank you. Thank you.